If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Luke chapter 2 and uh, sort of mark maybe Luke 24 and then eventually Revelation 5. So we're going to jump around just a little bit in the New Testament today. But we're going to start with Luke chapter 2. You've heard the Christmas story read, and from that we'll talk a little bit. This is actually the fourth week in our journey together considering the Lord Jesus during Advent. Because of the season, we've been considering his birth, but we've widened that view a little bit so that we can see where the manger and the cross intersect. In the Advent readings, if you've been following or have, have thought about it much, you realize that they and the sermons over this season have, have followed this particular path. We started with the humiliation of Jesus as he humbled himself in taking on flesh and dying for sinners. And then we looked at the helplessness of Jesus as a baby, including the escape to Egypt from the murderous plot of King Herod, and at the cross as he was enduring the torture of men as well as the wrath of God. And then last week we talked about the hiddenness of Jesus, considering his deity being hidden behind the veil of human flesh, not only at his birth, but in many ways throughout his life and death. And today our focus is on the honoring of Jesus, the glory of Jesus, if you will, for the first three weeks, our primary, primary emphasis was on Jesus' humanity. This week, our focus is tilted toward his deity. In spite of Jesus' humiliation and his helplessness and his hiddenness being on center stage, behind the scenes, his glory awaits to be acknowledged. It's always present, though often unnoticed. It's time to bring it out so that we can see. Certainly Paul did that in Philippians chapter 2, which has been the foundation really for this series of messages. Hear it again what Paul said, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That was mostly his humiliation, the helplessness and hiddenness of Jesus wrapped up into that section. And then this, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. There's the honor, there's the glory of Jesus in the last part of that text. Now, I suspect we view humiliation and all that goes with it as a separate entity from glory or honor. In other words, he endured the incarnation, he endured the obscurity, the misunderstandings, the betrayal and the denial, the torture, the crucifixion, the wrath of the Father, all of that terrible and then he is exalted, he is glorified. Now that's not wrong, but there was glory in the incarnation. There was glory in his life and death, as well as glory in the ultimate exaltation when he will be declared by all to be Lord of all. So I want us to see that. Some of this will be familiar, some maybe not so much. But before we go any further, I probably need to say something about glory, either define it or, or explain it just a little bit. Glorifying God involves our understanding of who God is and then of what we owe him. God's glory is the sum total of all that he is. If you take all the attributes of God and put them together and think about all of them, if that's even possible, that would be the glory of God. God is loving, God is holy, God is faithful, God is just, God is good, God is merciful, God is righteous. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, gracious, sovereign, pure, and we could probably go on for quite a while talking about all these things that God is. All of that together would be the glory of God. Since God is all of these things, and these things, these attributes make up His glory, for me to glorify God, then I need to acknowledge him and his attributes. But acknowledging them, I need to go a step further. I need to accept my circumstances as being allowed by him. And then I need to act in accord with his attributes. In doing so, I'm actually accenting 
the glory of God. So when the Bible talks about we are to glorify God, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do to glorify God, we are accenting that, and this is by acknowledging them, by accepting the circumstances that he has allowed, and then acting in according to who he is. An illustration might help. Um, suppose I'm faced with I'm faced with a tough situation in my family. How do I respond if I'm to give glory to God? Well, first, I would acknowledge something like this. God, I know you're good. I know you're righteous. I know you're faithful. So I start with acknowledging who he is. And then I, begin, then I think about the circumstances I'm in, and I begin to accept those. Uh, by I accept your circumstances as within your perfect plan because I know that you are good and faithful and all those other things. And then I would respond this way. God, help me to learn and to know what to do, what to say, what to be from this situation. Please conform my attitudes to reflect your character. That's accenting his glory. Get it? So to glorify God, we recognize who he is, and then we acknowledge that, and then we move from there to respond to that, and then that accents his glory. So let's get started. Jesus was honored at birth, and so we need to talk about the glory of his incarnation. You've heard Luke 2, 8 through 14, and then verse 20, how the angels glorified him, and then the shepherds glorified him. It was a great condescension to come to earth in flesh, but glory was not out of the picture. Angels and shepherds, Joseph and Mary, all honored Jesus at his birth. There were, there were varying degrees of acknowledging and accepting and accenting his glory, but it was present. Even though Jesus was taking a giant step down in terms of his humiliation, he was even at that moment being glorified by heaven and earth. He was honored and glorified because of what the incarnation meant. So what did the incarnation mean? Well, to begin with, the incarnation meant joy. We can glory in that. Remember what was said by the angel to the shepherds? Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of what? Great joy that will be for all the people. Granted, not everybody was filled with joy the time, the night that Jesus was born, and certainly not after the birth announcement was declared. Herod was not happy. Later, when it would be more fully revealed who Jesus was, a whole lot of people were not happy. However, there was more joy than any other emotion in regard to Jesus' birth. The angels probably didn't quite get why their creator was coming to earth as a human, but they rejoiced. In fact, in a manner of speaking, all of creation rejoiced because this is the beginning of the curse of sin being actively addressed. So when Jesus comes, having been promised by the prophets long ago, now he's on the scene. And think about, uh, the Bible often takes um, inanimate things, created things, the earth and the sea and animal kingdom and those kinds of things are often looked upon as bringing glory to God, as even, even personalized and, and using them in human terms to talk about them praising. Remember when Jesus talked about the rocks, and he said if, if they don't cry out, then the rocks will cry out and praise. Well, all creation is involved in the, in the expression of joy that now Jesus is on the scene and the potential for for redemption is in the works here. And so all of creation is rejoicing. Those who knew who he was were acknowledging him and accepting his purposes. And by their response, they were accenting his glory. The incarnation means joy. It means great joy for those who know who he is. It also meant salvation. We can glory in that. For unto you, says the angel, unto you is born this day in the city of David, what? A Savior. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. Herod saw Jesus coming, his potential demotion or even demise, but 
That was not true for the angels or for the shepherds or for Mary and Joseph or for anyone who understood the Old Testament scriptures. His name reflected his mission. He came to save. He was the promised Messiah. He was the promised deliverer. Israel had been waiting a long time for this promised one. About a thousand years had passed since the great King David had ruled over Israel. The one promised who would occupy David's throne, not just for a time, but forever, had come. This was great glory, a glorious time. There is great glory in that. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I wonder how that angel announcement came across. Unto you is born this day, today, in the city of David, Bethlehem, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Everyone who understood that, what was their response? Glory. He's here. Why wouldn't that be our response? So the incarnation meant salvation, and it meant joy, but it also means peace. And again, we can glory in that. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Peace generally is absent in a wicked world. In fact, the Bible would be a lot more, uh, a lot, a lot clearer than what I just said. There is no peace for the wicked, right? Jesus came to bring peace. He came as the God of peace because he is the God of righteousness. See, when we were justified, remember what Paul said in, in Romans? He said, therefore, having been justified, we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about the word justified, the, the definition for that is to declare righteous. So having been declared righteous, we have peace with God. There is no peace without righteousness. When God declares us righteous, then we have the peace of God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When the prophet Isaiah wrote of the child to be born, of the son to be given, he said the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The righteous God brings peace to us. He then declares us righteous that we might have peace. When we acknowledge and accept the truth that peace comes through Jesus, we have peace. The angel said that those with whom he was pleased would know this peace. Well, how do we please God? Any ideas? How about this? The writer of the Hebrews said, Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Interesting, isn't it? So when we trust him, when we believe in him, that pleases him. And when he is pleased, he is honored, he is glorified. He was born and lived most of his life in obscurity. But even under those circumstances, those who knew him, those who believed in him, brought him glory. The incarnation of Jesus means joy, it means salvation, it means peace, and it was glorious. Now, let's fast forward a little bit from toward the end of Jesus' earthly life. Perhaps nothing is more wrong, more terrible, more humiliating than the Son of God being crucified. But even in that, there was glory, great glory, for Jesus was honored at death because it was the glory of redemption. Here's the word I want to focus on. Luke 24, verses 25 through 27. The setting, remember Jesus is walking with a couple, going home from Jerusalem, on their way home to Emmaus. And as they're walking, Jesus appears. He has been crucified. He has been buried, he is now risen, but people don't know that yet, at least most do not. And he joins them in their journey. They don't know who he is, and they're kept from recognizing him. And he says to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things 
and enter into his glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. These people were confused. They didn't know it was Jesus, but Jesus opens their eyes to his glory even in death. And he starts by talking about the fulfillment of the promise. O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. For centuries, the Jews had been reading the Old Testament prophets. They had heard the Messianic Psalms read in synagogue. They had heard expositions from Isaiah and Jeremiah and the other prophets. They were even longing for a Messiah to come and rescue them. But somehow, they missed it. They failed to connect the dots when Jesus came on the scene. Many followed him. Many listened to him. Many loved him. But they didn't really believe who he was. Regardless, the Lord Jesus was the one of whom the prophets wrote. He was the fulfillment of their prophecies. There was great joy in that, even if it was mostly unknown at the time. The one promised by the prophets, that was Jesus. And that's glorious. So you have the the fulfillment of the promise. Now you have the culmination of that promise. And we can glory in that as well. For Jesus said to the couple, Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? There was glory in the cross and even greater glory once the cross work was completed. But isn't it interesting that even in heaven, the marks of Jesus from the crucifixion apparently are not erased. Even in all of the splendor and glory, he will still be seen, Revelation 5 says, A lamb standing as though it had been slain. Now, that's an interesting statement. I've often wondered about that Emmaus couple, how they miss seeing the marks on Jesus' hands and his feet. I don't know how many times I've said this to you, um, often before communion, where we talked about Jesus with this couple and he's saying these things and I've all usually assumed that Jesus again at their table they're about ready to eat and he's the one who prays normally it would be the host the the person of the home would pray Jesus takes the bread and he prays and he breaks it and he gives it to the to the people I've often thought when Jesus prayed that had to do it I mean when he started to pray they had to realize this this is no, no regular person here. This, this, something's different here. And, and I, that may well have happened. But I've kind of changed my view just a little bit. Now think about this. I have in my hands my glasses. That allows me to see this. And not you. I mean, no, I don't mean that. When I put these on, I can see close. I can see far as I am. Now, when I take these glasses, you're looking at the glasses, but what else are you seeing? You're seeing my hand. When Jesus took the bread, and he broke the bread, I wonder what they saw. I wonder if they saw the marks in his hand. And as soon as they did, he left. I'm speculating, obviously, But those marks of his death will be for us glory in heaven. For we will see and be reminded of the redemptive work of Jesus for eternity. But even at the cross there was glory. There was glory in his obedience to the Father. There was glory in the accepted sacrifice. There was glory in a completed work. There was glory in a defeated enemy. There was glory in the fulfillment of the plan of God for the ages, for the salvation of people for God's own possession. There was glory at the cross. He was honored not only in birth, not only in death, but Jesus was also honored forever. And we have the glory of exaltation. So I turn your attention to Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 to 13. In this great text, 
the scene is the throne of heaven and John receiving this incredible vision of the Christ in heaven, he writes, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. We can glory in that. Keep in mind that these angels were never redeemed. These angels in heaven around the throne, they had not rebelled against their maker as some had. Their joy was not so much in that, their joy was not really so much in our redemption. Their joy was found in the wonder of their creator that he would stoop so low to redeem sinful, condemned humans they couldn't understand it. Peter just sort of says something about angels long to look into that. The, the, the Greek word is they, they stoop over to see it. That he, that Jesus, would stoop so low to redeem sinful, condemned humans. They rejoiced in him. What he accomplished says volumes about him. About his power and his wisdom and his wealth and his might. And when they sang at his birth, it was amazing. But when this song of his redemptive work was complete and the angels began to rejoice in heaven, this song was off the charts. And the song continued. And there will be future crescendo when the final enemy is destroyed once and forever and the song of the angels will never end and it will be joined with others who are singing. And I heard, it says John, every creature in heaven, every creature on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Paul told us in Romans that when sin entered the world, the creation became corrupted. The current sounds of creation, you know what the current sounds of creation are? The same ones that you have when you get up in the morning, or some of you at least. Groans. Groans are not easy to listen to. There's not a lot of glory in groans. Groans are depressing. Those groans will change into songs of glory. One of the modern hymns that we've sung a few times that captures the essence of this goes like this. Creation longs for his return. When Christ shall reign upon the earth, the bitter wars that rage are, beth, are birth pains of the coming age. When he renews the land and sky, all heaven will sing and earth reply with one resplendent theme, the glory of our God and King. Hallelujah, let all creation stand and sing. Hallelujah, fill the earth with songs of worship. Tell the wonders of creation's King. And there in the middle of that creation song will be the song of the redeemed. Our song, and here it is. You want to know the words? Here it is. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Can you imagine the earth and the heavens are singing and the angels are blasting their chorus and then the redeemed, the ones who were the direct recipients of his great grace and mercy will all be singing together and if you can't carry a tune it won't matter because it will be loud and you'll be able to sing and it will be glorious and loud and nothing ever like it has ever been heard and it will reverberate throughout the ages songs of worship the wonders of creation's King and Redeemer. And our song does not need to wait till the end of the age. It can be sung right now. It's a song of honor. It's a song of glory. It's His glory. So Jesus was humbled in flesh. 
in some way helpless to avoid the pains and sufferings in life and in death experienced by humans in every age. Mostly his glory was hidden during those years. But the day is coming when his glory will be revealed and he will be honored above all and by all. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is God. He is Lord. Jesus Christ is Savior. He is Redeemer. He is Master and He will be glorified by all. All will acknowledge Him and His attributes. All will accept the truth of who He is. And all will act in accord with who He is. For all will confess that He is Lord. For those of us who have trusted Him will be welcomed into His presence with great joy. And that will result in great glory for Him. Those who have rejected Him will be sent from His presence forever. Even that judgment will declare His greatness and give Him glory. The contrast of eternal judgment and eternal life will declare that there is none like our God who is worthy of all glory. That's our Savior. The humble, helpless, hidden, but honored Savior. And like the hymn writer said, so we are called to this. Oh, come, let us adore him. Adoration, real adoration, only happens in the sphere of faith. You cannot adore him if you do not believe in him. You cannot believe in him unless you repent of your sins and embrace him as the only Savior and Lord. But if you trust him, you will enter into his glory. That's hope. That's the promise. And when we trust the Savior, it isn't by and by. It's here and now. We belong to him now. We are the recipients of his glory now. Paul will even say, when we trust Jesus Christ, we are carried into the heavenly places in him. We belong to him and we rejoice now, but there is something yet missing for we're still in sinful flesh. But one day we'll have no restrictions, no obstacles, nothing in the way. And it'll be pure, unmixed adoration to our Savior and King and Lord. Oh, come, let us adore. Father, we thank you for Jesus, we thank you for Christmas, we thank you for the incarnation, we thank you for the coming Savior, we thank you for faith in Jesus. My heart breaks if there are people in the sound of this voice who do not belong to you, who've never embraced you as Savior. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would penetrate their mind and heart, that you would open their mind and heart to believe the gospel, to recognize that outside of you they're lost and condemned, but if they will trust you, they will be, they will be new creations and you creations that are able to sing of the glory of their king. Oh, grant it to be true today that some will embrace Jesus by faith. For the rest of us, thank you for giving us a song a song to sing, a message to communicate, a truth to behold and to declare. Jesus Christ, Savior, King, Redeemer, Lord, Master, our precious Redeemer. Oh, we adore you. We thank you for Bind us with your blood, granting us life. Make our song sweet to a world that doesn't know what to do with sweetness. 
make our joy overflow, that it might spill over to those who have none, they might see the wonder of Jesus. Grant us mercy in these days for your glory alone.